An exciting new research project, SenUSA Bioenergy, is linking university researchers with enterprising farmers to create a Midwestern regional system for producing advanced biofuels. It is funded by the United States Department of Agriculture and led by Iowa State University. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we've got a, uh, a good topic to talk about today. Um, this topic is part of the CEN USA uh, Bioenergy Project that is a uh, USDA grant that uh, is hosted from uh, Iowa State but then have as a five-state project. And uh, with it, it being a bioenergy project, the project was about switchgrass. And uh, who we have today to talk with us are Carrie Jacobs and Chad Hart from uh, Iowa State University, who worked with uh, Rob Mitchell from University of Nebraska uh, and USDA and others to develop a decision tool that will help in, in deciding uh, and, and really helping farmers and decide the cost of production and, and other variables with respect to growing perennial grasses and switchgrass in particular. And so uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to, to Carrie and Chad. Uh, you can ask questions in the upper left-hand corner in the chat box, so feel free to type those in at any time. For sure, we'll get to those at the end, but uh, feel free to type those in as we go as you think of those questions. Uh, and I'm going to turn it over to Carrie. Well, hi, good morning, everyone. Hopefully you can hear me. Um, so thank you, John, for that introduction. Chad and I are sitting in the same room, and as John suggested, that he pretty much gave you the title slide there. This is a decision tool we've developed. Chad and I have been working on with it, working on it with a lot of input from Rob Mitchell. And the idea was, can we, can we go beyond an enterprise budget which lists costs and start to develop a tool that gives producers the ability to compare switchgrass with other cropland uses in the Midwest. And so that's really the focus of what we're doing today. So just a bit of background for those of you not familiar, what, the CEN, US, what CEN USA is all about. This is a project that's just beginning to enter its fifth year. And originally it was set out, the idea was how can we create a system for advanced transportation fuels derived from perennial grasses. And the, the, the catch on this is to do so in a way that doesn't remove a bunch of land from cropland production and places this in the landscape with other croplands, trying to place it in areas that are unsuitable or marginal for row crop production. Um, so in addition to producing advanced biofuels, trying to look at how to improve the sustainability of existing cropping systems. So those seem to be some important components of, of what this project is about. I am on objective six, which is the markets and distribution team. Chad is in a bunch of objectives. I think the primary one being the extension piece. And so this is one way to combine the extension piece along with beginning to think about the marketing of this system and how we address that going forward as a group. So real quick, just the primary drivers of this, and I, this is, these are slides you've seen before if you've been at a CENUSA web, webinar or heard me talk or probably even Chad, what's driving the need for this project is largely um, the, the, the desire for energy independence and also the variability we've seen over the last decades in oil prices and the, the, the need to find a way to somehow mitigate that. Also combine that with the expectations on world fuel use going forward, particularly in the areas like China and India and um, Africa, these developing countries, the expectations of their fuel use going forward is causing some, causing some push to look at alternative ways to get fuel. So that's definitely one piece of it. Combine that with the fact that we have a growing population and we need to do, the, do so, find alternative uses for fuel in such a way that doesn't impact the ability to feed the growing populations of the world. So this idea of creating a system where you're not having major impacts on traditional food crops or crops that are used to feed animals that are for food is also important here. And then also, of course, the mandates that we have at the federal level for renewable fuels in our fuel system in the U.S. going forward. So this is the Sun USA's grand vision. Um, this, this chart has, has gotten a lot of use, and you've probably seen this, but the idea is to think about ways in which we grow perennial grasses on the landscape integrated with, cover, integrated with crops um, for grains, also thinking about how to 
have positive impacts on environmental things that we're seeing. Um, think about the co-products that are produced from this and the, whole, the system as a whole is really what this project is about. So fundamental challenges, I'm on the e in the economics side of this and the, mar the marketing and, and distribution and some of the fundamental challenges facing switchgrass for biofuels that we've been talking about for a long time is the simple fact that there's no, there's no develop, well-developed market right now. We see a few pockets of development in the U.S., but this lack of a, a commercial market is problematic and largely driven, as you can imagine, by the fact that economic returns just haven't been there yet, at least not to the degree necessary to provide investments and infrastructure in this industry. What we know about producers, and this has been seen through surveys and we hear this echoed in extension meetings and um, meetings with producers, Producers are not just looking at the profitability of their system. They've got to be able to maximize some sort of expected utility. And what comes into play there, if you're not familiar with that, is option value. So the switching from switch from crop, traditional cropland production, which is a one-year decision, over to a perennial system is risky in the sense that you don't know what crop prices are going to do in upcoming years, and you're basically locking yourself into the system for 10 in, in our case, the system we're considering an average of 10 years. So that option value plays a significant role in this. Also, you know, one key thing that we have not begun to fully incorporate and, and being able to do that is potentially a long way off are these non-market benefits and costs. We know a system like perennial grasses has the potential to produce environmental benefits through so reduced soil erosion and water quality, and these are benefits that we see having an impact not just at the farm level, but also on a societal level. The problem in, the problem with these is, these are that we might, we don't have market prices for them. So finding a way to, first of all, identify how large the benefits are and their dollar values, what dollar value we assign to that, no one knows how to do that yet. And I think that's part of what um, objective four in this, in this, um, this project is looking at developing metrics for that, but as you'll see today, we've not incorporated anything into this tool that has to do with non-market benefits, societal benefits. Most of what we're looking at are the measurable on-farm costs and returns associated with this system. And also, we know that the economic impacts go beyond the biofuel market, and there's feedback effects. So if some land does move out of crop production, if it causes changes in, in crop rotations, if it causes changes in where crops are grown, some sort of shifting of traditional corn and soybean into the wheat areas, all these things come into play, taking CRP out of effect potentially. We know there's a lot of feedback effects that go along with, that, that come along when you start talking about land use changes on a major scale. And again, this tool is not looking at those feedback effects. We are just measuring the on-farm effects from a, a very cost and returns, very um, economic, locally focused, uh, locally focused view. And finally, one, one thing that we're charged with here, and this hopefully this tool helps develop a conversation or informs a conversation about this, is given cost and returns to switchgrass production and given the economic environment we're in, what kind of policies will be needed to continue to shape this market if, we, if, if it's identified that this is a market that, that we want to pursue who, here in the U.S.? So hopefully this tool will help start a conversation and fuel that conversation going forward. A little bit about the decision tool before we show it. It does take a cost of production approach, so we are basing this on, on enterprise budgets, and these were put together by Rob and Chad, worked hard on these to get a sense of what are the costs associated with producing switchgrass. I said before that it's not just an enterprise budget approach, but that's certainly the start for all this. Making switchgrass profitable in an enterprise budget, showing that profitability is a challenge for the reasons we already talked about, one of which is we don't know, we haven't talked about this yet, but one of which we don't know, we don't know what the market price for switchgrass is yet. Also, being profitable is not a sufficient condition is necessary, but sufficiency requires that it be the most profitable alternative. So overcoming profitability hurdle is one, overcoming profitability is one hurdle, the other would be how can you be more profitable than the next best alternative. So that's the opportunity cost approach here. Uh, I've already mentioned that. So competing use and opportunity cost, opportunity cost the, 
the, the competing alternatives we're going to talk about today that are introduced in this tool are CRP, corn plus stover crop production, corn and soybean rotations with the potential for stover and pasture for gra hazing, excuse me, haying and grazing. Um, these are the four alternative crops we're going to consider, and as you might imagine, we think that switchgrass probably most closely competes with pasture for haying and grazing, and so that's something we're going to focus on initially. This is a chart that shows, for example, if, if you're worried about land that competes with hay acres, here's what those prices have done over time, and you can see that in recent years anyway, the, the demand for hay has been such that the price per ton has been pretty high. And so even on land that is suited for, well suited for hay, which we also suspect then could be well suited for perennial grass production, overcoming that opportunity cost of foregone hay production is, can be significant. Also competition with corn acres here in the Midwest, that's a, that's a you can't talk about switchgrass without talking about competition with corn. We at one point put together, the, this slide was actually put together, I think by Richard Perrin is where these data are stolen from, but it basically shows, shows how if you take the price of corn and you look at based on what we think are reasonable, um, reasonable switchgrass yields, you're talking about switchgrass overcoming corn only at very low, let me add these in, very low yields on corn, which suggests it has to be marginally productive land, marginally productive from a revenue side, from, a, from um, also a yield side, but the, the marginal production is, is the key here. Um, if we say that current expected price of corn is somewhere less than $4 a bushel, and that's certainly where we are today, it is suggests that in general switchgrass is more profitable if corn yields are $80 per, excuse me, 80 bushels per acre or less. So this, what this essentially highlights is we're looking at marginal land. So that this doesn't account for is the fact that there's still, if you consider stover in your crop production, corn, corn rotation or corn soybean rotation, that then makes it even harder for switchgrass to overcome that, that profitability. Things that I've hit on that we've not, atop, not accounted for in this tool, indirect effects, land taking out, taken out for food or feed production is one area that will be replaced from someone else, somewhere else. This also has environmental impacts and also the real options consideration here that switchgrass is a 10-year commitment, uncertainty in corn prices. If you're trying to make the decision, essentially what you're forced to do, and we'll show this in the decision tool, is, is um, put in an expected corn price, and being able to develop an expectation of corn price be much beyond the current or next marketing year is challenging, which makes, it, which makes developing these budgets challenging as well for switchgrass. So as the, and again, we'll show this as, as we get to the tool, but the basic approach to this tool is when the users pull it up, users are going to be asked to respond to a series of questions that we've tried to make divide this in such a way that those who are looking for quick answers can get those in this tool on a very basic page by entering in some information that we believe producers know off the top of their heads and can easily provide. And then um, what they're going to receive on that, the outputs that they're going to get are going to be estimated revenues for and costs for switchgrass, some break-even break even figures on um, timing of the system, in other words, how many years it takes to break even, break even required yields for switchgrass and price, and then importantly, a comparison of the returns to alternative crop, crop or production practices. Um, let me back up a second. We don't, we don't presume that we're doing this perfectly, but we think this is a good first step in trying to get some of these practices right and get some of the comparisons correct. So give us just a second. We're going to try and share our screen here to show you the tool, and I'm going to have Chad, Chad lead us off for that. Okay. So as we go here, John included a link in the chat box. That link is actually to the um, uh, enterprise budget that is sort of the backbone of this tool, but it's not this tool itself, so it's just part of it. And Gene, you put a comment up there that says um, it only needs to be the most profitable if we appear to um, Friedman's principles, so it can be lower profit if there are societal benefits. I would agree with that, but part of the issue we're looking at here is, is that no one can agree on the sheer size of those societal benefits. 
and that in dealing with our producers out there in the countryside, for the most part, they talk about hard dollars and cents. And so most of them will concentrate on that most profitable crop. Some will um, extend to look at those societal benefits. And so what we've tried to do and what Carrie's pulled up on the screen is create a tool that at least takes a shot at that like economic cost and benefit of this crop or these crops. And so what you should be seeing now is a spreadsheet. Um, and in this case, it's the first tab says start here at the bottom. And in fact, if you look to the lower left, you'll see a tab that says start here. And what uh, Carrie's actually done here, she's taken a, um, a spreadsheet that I worked on uh, based off of information Rob Mitchell provided. And that's actually the link that John provided in the upper left-hand corner, which was created a, a cost structure to the growing of uh, Liberty switchgrass, a specific variety that, that Rob Mitchell's put together over the past few years looking for a bioenergy switchgrass. She's extended that tool to begin to look at the market component of this. And so built upon that cost structure, she said, okay, let's look at not only the potential revenues from switchgrass, but then comparing those revenues to those cro probable crop alternatives. Because going back to this point of if switchgrass is going to enter the landscape here, it needs to not only show some sort of profitability, but it needs to be able to compete against alternatives out there. And so as you look at this start here sheet that she's got, this is just sort of, if you will, the wording behind describing what this tool does, how it's sort of constructed, and what we envision going forward is that this page will also include a listing of a lot of resources here created through not only the Sen USA project, but uh, already existing products that are out there talking about perennial grasses, uh, their cost structures, establishment guidelines, the inputs, the economics behind perennial grasses, and also talking about the logistics. Because as, as Carrie sort of mentioned here, when we look at perennial grasses, there's a strong parallel between that sort of production process and market and what we see with the, the hay market. And so we're addressing some of the same logistical problems that the livestock industry already has with the hay industry. Now, in, in looking at this tool, I'll try to highlight a couple of features here. If I can, probably the first, and my apologies here, I'm doing this with my other hand. Uh, the purpose of this tool, again, to guide producers that are considering switchgrass for biomass. What we do in this tool is we take in the best information that we have available from us from our San USA team and other researchers across the country and try to basically put together what we would consider a representative budget for the production of switchgrass and allow the user to come in and, and look at you know default values on that budget, but also build a tool that would allow users to input their own specific field characteristics cost structures and so forth to evaluate how switchgrass would compare. As we mentioned, you know, Carrie, what she's done is created a basic decision tool that basically says, we're going to start out with some questions to try to guide people through this process and have them answer those questions and give them a very quick and what we hope is easy um, analysis to look at here as they consider switchgrass. But if they want to dig a little deeper, we've also created this where it has an advanced tool structure where they can go in very specifically and provide some detailed cost estimates as they go out there. Carrie's already went through a lot of the assumptions that went in the tool, but the idea is that, you know, this is, again, based upon um, the research that has been developed over the past four years within the Sen USA project and actually research that extended back into the past beyond that. When you look at the work that Rob and the, the group over there at Lincoln have done on perennial grasses. They've been working on these for decades. And so we're standing, if you will, on the top of their shoulders, um, looking at what we consider the best information we have on perennial grasses at the time. So what I'd like to do with you right now is take you right into what I consider the heart of the tool that I'm gonna give Carrie a lot of credit for here, is that what she's designed is a series of questions to help guide users through this analysis of looking at switchgrass. And so what you're seeing on the screen right now is um, a snapshot of that 
what I consider the first main page of this tool. And what she's done is she's designed a series of questions to help elicit where the producer is in their decision, what sort of lands that they're looking to convert over, what are the possible alternatives, and then saying, okay, let's compare the, the economic returns to them. And so I'll start with question number one, she, or questions one, two, and three, and I'll see if I can highlight them here. And these are what I consider the setup questions. Uh, question one, how do you control this field? Uh, one of the things that we need to consider when we look at the switchgrass decision, as, as Carrie mentioned, it is not a one-year decision, it is a multi-year decision. And sometimes it's, if you will, much easier to make that multi-year decision on the land that you own as opposed to the land that you rent for fear that that rented land may uh, come out of your possession. And so that's going to influence uh, the possibility here of do you move to switchgrass or not. Question two asks, how many acres in this field are you considering for switchgrass? So what's the scale that we're looking at here in terms of a potential move here? And then finally, what, you know, we've learned the question, what is the recent crop, cropping history of the field? Because we would see that most recent cropping history as the most likely alternative to switchgrass at this time. Now, the defaults here, when you look at question one, if I can get this to work here as well, we basically built in a drop-down menu here where you can choose owner, operator, or cash renter, depending on, again, how do you control the field. Producer can come in here and enter the number of acres in the field, so you can change that from one to 10,000. Um, but the most important part here is that choice of the recent cropping history. And as Carrie mentioned, we consider four alternatives. And I'll apologize for the small print on the screen, but we wanted to show you the tool live as we could. And in this case, she mentioned it was CRP, uh, continuous corn rotation, a corn soybean rotation, both of those including the potential for stover being marketed as well, and then finally the, the pasture for haying and grazing. And so depending on what they choose there, with this one it determines the other questions that we see along the line. So let me start with CRP since we've got that sort of as the default. Below, once you enter CRP, these questions below that will change. Some of them you'll notice are what we call intentionally left blank, others uh, will fill in, and those questions change depending upon what you choose up here for the recent cropping history. Go ahead, Carrie. you look like you had this question. Yeah. Okay, so as we look at CRP, our questions are, is this field, if it were in production today, what would its per acre cash rent equivalent be? In this case, we ask for a cash rent equivalent because, again, the land could be owned, it could be rented, but we do need to reflect what are uh, the opportunity cost of that land, what's it take cost to keep that land in some sort of production or in within agricultural framework here. Question two under the CRP is what would be your potential CRP payment? So again, as we're looking at this, if you will, competition between switchgrass and alternatives, when we're looking at CRP, it's a, what is the relative profitability of entering into the CRP program? And that difference would be basically how much is the CRP program going to pay me versus what's my cost of being within CRP. Part of that cost is, okay, you do have some maintenance cost on that land that enters in the CRP. We ask you to enter that. And then we have a couple of follow-up questions down here below as well. And these have to do with if we were converting this CRP land into switchgrass, uh, best production practices would indicate that you would probably want to take that acreage, enter it into row crop production at least for a year before transitioning over to switchgrass. And the most likely alternative there would be soybeans or some herbicide resistant crop. And so we've asked for, okay, if you're going to convert over, what would be your expected soybean yield and expected soybean price for that transition year as you were to move from CRP into switchgrass production over time. Now, like I mentioned, as you choose different um, alternatives, moving from CRP, for example, to continuous corn, oops, sorry, there we go, you'll notice that the questions change uh, along with the, the yellow highlighted boxes. In this case, the yellow highlighted boxes are where we'd be looking for information to be input by the user. Um, the questions when you move to continuous corn change to, we still have the uh, cash rent equivalent up there, but now instead of asking for your CRP payment, if you're looking at being in continuous corn and moving to switchgrass, we ask you, okay, what's your corn yield? 
that you're expecting there, what's the corn price you expect. And then since the, you know, it's not only just the corn grain that we're having to compete with, but also the stover, we have questions asking if stover will be removed, what's the expected revenue from that, and what are the production costs to corn? Because what we're going to have to end up doing here is, again, comparing the costs and revenues of continuous corn and the stover production versus what potential revenues and costs we would have from switchgrass. If we were to move to a corn soybean rotation, again, we'll get different questions here. So here we would ask those same sorts of questions on the cash rent, the corn yield, the corn price, the stover questions. But again, we here we also, since we're doing the rotation, we follow up soybean yield, soybean price, soybean production cost. Again, to fill out that enterprise budget uh, side on the competing crop here. And then finally for pasture, the questions again change is still we ask the cash rent equivalent. Here then we turn around and say, okay, what's the return from hanger grazing on this field? And again, we're considering this is the alternative. If the land were in pasture and moving to switchgrass, again, best management practices would indicate we would want to eliminate the weed condition in the field and the easiest way to do that is to move it to row crop for one year at least again that herbicide tolerant crop to help reduce the weed pressure establish the grass into if you will a clean field and then produce the grass from there once we get through answering those questions on the different practices then we come down and start talking about switchgrass production inputs and these questions you'll notice remain the same throughout all all these alternatives. We ask, how many years do you anticipate having this field in switchgrass? In this case, in talking with Rob and looking at the, the productive life of switchgrass, is it, you know, the average is around 10 years, can be as short as seven, can be as long as 15. And so, you know, what, what's the potential, if you will, life cycle of the switchgrass you're looking at there? How many years of productivity do you expect from that initial planting? This is getting into that long-term structure looking at here. Again, switchgrass is not a one-year decision, it's a multi-year. How many years are we talking about having this field in production? We also ask uh, expected yield of, for harvested biomass in the year of the planting. So typically, in the case of a perennial grass, you don't reach full productivity in that first year. Um, we've asked uh, Dr. Mitchell to give us some guidelines as to, you know, some bounds on this. And so you'll see an additional note there that, you know, one and a half to two and a half tons per acre can be typical, especially here in the upper Midwest. That's what he was finding with his research plots as we look out there. It can be as little as zero. It can be as high as near for production. Um, in the year following planting, again, you expect to see some yield change there. Uh, Again, since switchgrass is a, is a multi-year uh, production process, what tends to happen is, if you will, your yield, your productive capability increases slowly or ramps up slowly to reach full production. So that first year may be a little bit less than half of a yield. That second year, you're up close to two-thirds of the full potential yield. And then finally, by year three, we expect you to be basically at full productive capacity uh, Rob indicated, at least for the Liberty switchgrass, that four to six tons per acre would be fairly typical up here for the upper Midwest. Then we hit on the, what I consider the crucial number here, and this is the one that, you know, Kerry talked about that we really don't have right now. What's the price that we expect to sell this harvested grass at, especially when we're looking at it from a bioenergy perspective? Uh, you know, there's very limited markets right now on the cellulosic biofuel side on bioenergy. And so we put in um, a target number here of $80 per ton, but one of the things that we've talked about here is that you can look at the secondary market, if you will, for the grass, and in this case, there is a fairly well-established market here when we're looking at forages, you know, again, comparing to the hay market. And when you look at a, a switchgrass like Liberty, it has been designed for bioenergy, so it's not necessarily tuned specifically for feed. And so it probably would draw a price that's you know average or maybe a little bit lower than average in terms of that feed quality value. 
And so that would give you some basis of comparison in which in order to set a price. And then finally, just how many bales would you expect to see, um, you know, what's your bale size as you would look to harvest this crop? And so as we anticipate trying to calculate out what your yields and returns would be from this crop. Once a user enters all that in, and as you can see here, we have default values built in to the system, what it creates then is this output section over here on the right-hand side, which I've sort of highlighted all in gray. That gives a very quick um, sort of analysis based upon these default values of the cost and revenues of switchgrass. That would be the top part of this table, the expected annualized cost, the expected revenue in that first basically field preparation year and planting year you might have, what about the year following planting, and then finally full production years. So that you can see, you know, what this tool builds in is as yields ramp up, given the price level that we're seeing there, you would expect revenues to be ramping up over time as well. So we get uh, that first shot of looking at cost and revenues of switchgrass. The second stage looks at the break-even part of the equation. So how many years does it take for the switchgrass to break even on its own? What sort of grass yield would we need to average over the productive life of the grass in order for this system to break even? Or turn it around, what sort of price level would we need to have this break even? And as you can see in this case, uh, you know, this system would be looking to break even basically uh, over the productive life cycle of the grass. We have it breaking even in 11 years. And in this case, it would be the 10 years of productivity from the grass plus the one year transition um, that was built in here as we move from pasture land into switchgrass production. We'd be looking at needing to average a yield of just under four bushels or four tons per acre, which is, as you know, noted by Dr. Mitchell's notes there, is well within the range of what he would consider typical here in the upper Midwest. Or flip that around, we need to see a grass price around $71 per ton for this to work out. And then finally, making that comparison to that next best alternative here. So in this case, we create the annual return coming back to switchgrass, that annual return to pasture, and then compare the two. And so in this case, that's the, to me, the, the true bottom line here. How, does the, how do the economic returns from switchgrass align against pasture? In this case, there would still be a benefit towards pasture given the default values we have in there, but it wouldn't take too many changes for this to, to look the other way. In fact, probably one of the biggest things I'm looking at here is if you change any sort of value here. So let me say that, you know, we'll go with Rob's um, idea and let's stay on the low end here, that maybe I can get 1.5 tons that first year. I'm looking at, say, three and a half tons getting in the average by that second year. And then say I'm highly productive and I can get that six tons as we look out there for that third year. Suddenly, you know, the numbers flip. I'm looking at a break even a year sooner. I'm looking at expected returns to grass that can definitely compete with pasture land, in fact, outcompete for that land as we look out there. So again, the users have the ability to modify this system based upon what they know about their local market, what they know about the productivity of their soil, and factor that in very quickly to look at the potential returns from switchgrass versus those alternatives. Now the main engine behind this tool is this tab called Advanced Inputs. And if I take you there, this should look like uh, the link that, that John provides in the chat box in the upper left-hand corner. So this is the cost structure that's built behind the tool. And for a more sophisticated user, you can see the yellow boxes here on this chart. The yellow boxes are all um, changeable by the user to personalize this tool to their own production um, situation. What we've got in here, just to very quickly go through here, the line 11 is the land charge. This is where we look at what's the cost of the land being utilized there. That goes back to that first uh, question on, on the input side uh, of our uh, first spreadsheet. Then we get into what are the pre-establishment costs. Basically, what cost do you have to build in as you transition this land from wherever it's been into switchgrass production. Then we look at pre-harvest machinery operations. 
And all of these are based upon uh, the production practices that have even been outlined by Rob and his team over um, in Lincoln as they looked at uh, perennial grasses and also some of the, the work that's been done here at Iowa State looking at um, uh, grasses such as uh, miscanthus. Then we've also got operating expenses here, including soil testing. I've got to remember I'm doing this with my left hand. Um, you know, that there would be some seed cost as, as you're, you're you know, buying the seed here. And in fact, let me highlight that one just to show that when we're looking at the switchgrass component here, not only do you have some seed cost in that year of planting, but oftentimes in the, trying to make that establishment take hold, there is some follow-up planting in the second year uh, to basically cover some of the spots that didn't take in the first year. So we do build that into this tool. We also do build in a little bit of fertilizer cost based upon, you know, as you harvest that grass, there are some nutrients removed um, that will need to be offset. Again, that's something that, you know, can be personalized by the user here. There's also some need to uh, control weeds. Like I say, that's one of the biggest things as we looked at the, let's call it the establishment cost, the internal cost of, of moving the switchgrass is weed control is a, is a very big issue, especially as you look within the first couple of years of the movement into switchgrass. And then finally, you know, what's the cost to harvest that switchgrass as you move forward? So there's a lot of detail uh, behind that basic tool structure that you see on the first tab. As users play with this, we've also built in uh, default values so they can always go back and, and refill in or repopulate uh, the numbers if they ever want to go back to the default values. And then uh, to sort of summarize it, you know, give a little pictorial form here, we've built this to where it looks at the individualized returns from the switchgrass or from the alternative and looks over that entire life cycle for the switchgrass. So here's the comparison for switchgrass versus the pasture land example that I had before. And as you can see here, switchgrass represented in blue, we have a, a very strong, if you will, negative return in the planting year because of the limited productive productivity of the grass in that first year. That improves a little bit in the second year, but it's year early years three through 10 where you see the potential returns coming to switchgrass. Whereas with pasture, the assumption is that we'll have a fairly steady return throughout that entire period of time. This graph updates as you change not only the, the parameters there, but if you were to change uh, the alternative that you're looking at here. So I'm gonna to move to the corn soybean rotation. Go back to that chart, you'll notice you get a, a slightly different graph here. It's looking again at switch graphs. Uh, the return should roughly be the same here for that, but it updates that alternative. And so looking at corn soybean rotation right now, what we're seeing is, Given today's expected prices for corn of around three dollars and seventy-five cents a bushel, soybeans USDA projects at nine fifteen per bushel. We're looking at that rotation actually not offering very strong returns right now, and so switchgrass definitely does have some opportunities there. On, as Carrie mentioned, some of the more marginal lands here where your yields are already diminished due to the soil productivity. Also with low prices for traditional row crops, here's where alternative crops such as switchgrass definitely have that potential. And so this tool, uh, there's a lot going on in here. There's, you know, uh, just the enterprise budget for switchgrass. There's the enterprise budget for the alternative crops. There's the potential revenues for all of those crops being considered as well and this comparison across those. And so what we, I guess, hope we built here is a tool that, like I say, tries to stylize and, and sort of simplify all that into a series of questions that I'm going to say that carry, uh, I think, very well put together on this front end. You basically, you know, within 20 questions for the most part, and probably more like 15, you get to a lot of information in a short amount of time. This web seminar is brought to you by SENUSA Bioenergy with support from the United States Department of Agriculture, National Institute of Food and Agriculture. For more information, go to SENUSA.org.
dot iastate dot edu.